Ah, crap, that wasn't supposed to happen. Somebody, the studio's on fire! <sighs> Who is it now? I'm trying to play a game here. Hello. Oh, hey, it's my good friend, Youngtown. What's up, Smash? Hey, Youngtown buddy, what's up? How have you been? Hey, man. Did you hear about Gerard? Oh, did he finally complete Sonic 06? No. He's Because I think he should complete Sonic 06. That's an original suggestion. That's never been suggested before. Ever by anyone. I'm a genius. He's been found dead. Uh, oh. Oh. H how? A body was found in the forest by a group of hikers. The reports later identified it as Gerard Dragon Rider Khalil. What? What? What attacked him? What? Was it bears? No. It was by a whale. What made you think bears? I don't know. <laughs> well, I suppose the next obvious question is. What was he doing in the middle of a forest all by himself, but... Wait a second. Who will... Who will complete the games now? I don't know. We gotta find someone willing. Someone with excellent gaming skills. Someone with... Wait! I just had a thought. This entirely random Skype conversation at 2 in the morning must be some kind of sign. Truly, it's me. I must be the one to complete all the games! I must be the one to complete the completionist legacy. C complete the completion, completion, the, the 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 legacy thing. I gotta do it. It's obviously me. Clearly, the signs. No, I, I just wanted to tell you that the guy's dead. You know, I know you like his videos and stuff. So. No. Nope. This is destiny. What game? What game? What game? Uh, Smash? What? What about that game? What game? The one in your hand. Paper Mario Sticker Star, how I wonder what you are. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of The Completionist. Now uh, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering where Gerard is and who I am. Uh, you know, well, um, Gerard, he, uh, he couldn't make it today. He's, uh, he's busy being dead, uh, d damn near close to completing Sonic 06, you guys! So yeah, so he'll be busy for the next 20 hours-ish. Yeah, that should be that should be enough time for me to flee the country. Let's um, so um, you know. And don't worry, guys. I may not have you know the beard. I mean, I do, I do technically, but it's not like you know. Mmm, -hmm, Gerard's beard. <laughs> but I do have the skills that it takes for completion. So let's not waste any time and jump right into today's game. Wrong one. There we go. Paper Mario Sticker Star. The fourth Paper Mario title as well as the first entry to be released on a handheld, the 3DS. This game, while mostly getting positive reviews, has left some people who are fans of the first two games' gameplay a little iffy. Is it a game worth checking out, more or less completing? We're about to find out. 
But Scruffy Man, didn't you already make a video about Jontron? Why are you doing one for Beardman? Why don't you have an awesome beard? Why are you doing this Paper Mario game? What's with all the stickers? Can a piece of paper learn to love and be loved in return? Um, Youngtown? Yes? What are you doing? Well, since I knew it would be pointless to try and talk you out of this, I figured the next best thing would be to play along. So I thought I'd be Greg. That's usually his bit around this point in the reviews. Bugs Gerard, steals the color, all that stuff. Wait, what? He got attacked by a whale too? No, only Gerard was found. I think Greg's at the space resort. That lazy butt! Alright, so stop me if you've heard this one before. Everything's all hunky-dory in the Mushroom Kingdom, when suddenly- STOP! Ah! Sorry, you told me to stop you. I'll... alright then. Anyway, you guessed it, Bowser shows up and wreaks havoc, and it's at an event called the Sticker Fest, an annual event in which citizens come to witness the Sticker Comet flying by, which is said to have the power to grant wishes. The comet descends onto the stage and Bowser shows up, only with intent to steal it, but he ends up accidentally smashing it. What? Bowser was actually gonna steal something other than Peach for once? Oh, no, uh, don't worry, he still does that too. Whew. For a second there, I thought Nintendo was actually trying. Smashing the sticker comet causes these objects called Royal Stickers to fly out. One lands on Bowser's head, causing him to go berserk and destroy the sticker fest before making off with Peach. Mario then meets a sticker named Kirsty, a sticker fairy who is the caretaker of the Royal Stickers. After liberating the scattered toads in the town, the two set off to various worlds to gather stickers, help toads, fight bosses powered by royal stickers, and of course, rescue Peach from Bowser. Your standard Mario stuff. Minus the stickers, of course. That, that, that one's new. I guess you could call this a pretty flat plot. the few 3DS games where I'd say that 3D is actually pretty good. I almost never use the 3D feature on my 3DS, but this game found me turning it back on every now and again, especially during battles and in paperized mode, which we'll get to in a bit. Speaking of paper, this game emphasizes its flatness more so than any other past game. Plenty of paper puns and visual gags to go around. Not much to say, if you've played Paper Mario games, you know what to expect from the overall look of things. Stylized graphics, plenty of color, all that good stuff. Though while colorful and good and all that, the worlds in this game are your standard Mario worlds. In games past, you went to places like Wrestling Rings, a prehistoricish area, a prison fortress. Here it's Grass World, Desert World, Snow World, etc. Not that it's bad, it's all done well, it's just nothing brand spanking new that you've never seen before. Although I gotta give World 3 some kudos, this has the best atmosphere out of the whole game. You're in a forest that's heavily polluted by this purple poisonous goop. Even in broad daylight, this place is dark and unsettlingly dangerous, and that music is actually pretty creepy in its own right. Unfortunately, once you find the source of the goop and get rid of it, the forest goes back to being all yippy skippy. Kinda funny, I like this forest more when it's heavily polluted than when it's clean. Remember kids, proper cycling and waste dumps are so last decade. Come on, purple's everyone's favorite color, isn't it? The most notable aspect of this game, however, in my opinion, is the music. This might be the best Paper Mario game to date in terms of its soundtrack. Everything's so jazzy and upbeat, even the songs that aren't supposed to sound like Sunshine and Rainbows, like the Poisoned Woods one, are awesome. There's also some subtly funny moments as well. Take this one scene, for example. This is supposed to be an oasis, but all the water was sucked away by a tornado, and this toad looks like he's literally about to die of thirst. Once you fill the oasis back up with water, he just nonchalantly floats up to you in the pool with sunglasses on and a smoothie on a float, and has a really calm, cool, collected expression. It's the subtle things like that. My question is, if he could just pull out smoothies out of nowhere, why couldn't he get me one too? I saved his life. I'm the sticker star here. However, not all characters are winners. Like, for example, Kirsty herself I found to be a pretty weak companion, especially when compared to Super Paper Mario's Tippy, as well as party members from the games before that. In this game, Kirsty has a couple of moments, I think, but she lacks any development some characters or series past had. 
For example, she gets kidnapped twice in this game, and every time Mario saves her, other than a thank you, she undergoes little, if any, personality change. Not even Bowser Jr. and Kamek are developed enough. Well, Bowser Jr. to me was never developed enough to begin with, but Kamek in this game acts kind of like this game's version of Dementio, which I thought in turn would lead to something kind of cool further on in the game, but more on that later. This game is unlike any Paper Mario game up until this point, let alone any RPG. For starters, you now travel from locations via a world map. Leveling up, party members and the like are also gone. In combat, you use stickers. You can buy stickers from shops or pick up stickers scattered across the land, and when you use a single sticker once in combat, it's gone for good. But you can hold multiple of the same sticker. So this game is more about resource management, which I didn't really find to be necessarily a bad thing, as this means you don't have to worry about grinding so much. In fact, the only incentive to get into fights purposefully is to earn coins that you can use to buy more stickers and use the battle spinner, which we'll get to in a sec. So when you have enough coins to last you for a while, you don't need to go picking fights on purpose all the time. When you do get into combat, here's how everything goes down. There's many types of stickers, including various jumps, hammers, as well as fire flowers, ice flowers, shells, frog suits, raccoon tails, etc. If you can name it, chances are it's in this game as a sticker. You can use one sticker per turn, and unlike past games where you can choose which foe to attack, Mario automatically defaults to whatever enemy's in front. However, there's the aforementioned Battle Spinner. Whenever you have three coins, which is almost always, pressing X will allow you to use it. If you line up two of the same image, you'll be able to use two stickers during your turn, thus usually meaning you can damage more enemies in a single turn. If you line up three of the same image, you'll be able to use three stickers as well as get a little bonus depending on what the images are. For example, if you line up three coins, you'll get a refund and then some. There is another method of attack. Hidden around the levels are mysterious, fully three-dimensional objects that's unlike anything else seen in this paper world, called things. When Mario finds a thing, he can use a Sling a Thing booth to turn the thing into a sticker that he can use in combat. Thing stickers generally are much stronger than regular stickers, and they're not really needed for much except for bosses, but one of the most notable features about each thing, besides the attack itself, that I feel needs mentioning is their own unique animations, and they're actually pretty funny. But some of my favorites include the birthday cake, and the water gun, and the turkey. certainly make my Thanksgivings more interesting. Although, something appears to be wrong with the bowling ball thing when it comes to bosses. Glitches with old man snitches! Diablo's always cheating when we go bowling. It was bad when he could modify the scoreboard while I went to get those delicious pretzels that pretty lady behind the counter sells. But now he's going to freeze time and space over it? What a sore loser, that Diablo. Once you find a thing and use it, you can either return to the place you found it and get it again, or you can buy it from a shady-looking toad near the Sling-A-Thing booth back in town. Be warned, the more powerful things tend to get a little pricey. Stickers and things can also be used on the field. When you press X, you'll go into Paperize Mode. If you use Paperize Mode in certain areas, you can use stickers to cover stuff up, use them to make question mark blocks appear with better stickers in them, usually, and use things to progress further in the game. So make sure you search high and low. Paperize mode is also used to place blue door stickers. Blue doors are only available after you reach World 3-6, and can very rarely be found in later levels. When you apply a blue door sticker to an outline in Paperize mode, you can go through the door and obtain whatever bonus is on the other side, the bonus usually being a thing. This means to complete this game, you'll have to buy a lot of blue doors. So many blue doors. The guy who invented these stickers has no taste. Where's the purple love? However, the battle spinner and paperized mode are only available when Kirsty is with you. So the aforementioned kidnappings will certainly throw a wrench into your plans. Keep this in mind. In each level is a comet piece, sometimes multiple. While grabbing a comet piece unlocks a new level for you to explore, you can also earn coins depending on how many stickers you used and how many enemies you defeated in that level. The bosses, disappointingly, are simply bigger versions of pre-existing Mario enemies, which is a shame as previous games had some really neat original bosses. Having said that though, these bosses are a challenge that usually require you to block attacks well and use things and other attacks strategically. 
make sure you come prepared, but don't worry. If all else fails, you can just book it out of there and try again later. There are also flagpoles that appear later in the game at the Sticker Fest while it's being rebuilt. Completing certain objectives will display a flag, which we'll get to more later, because right now, you know what time it is. It's time to lay the smack down on a certain giant mutated turtle. Again. So you've collected all but one of the royal stickers, collected things, got buttloads of coins, and blue doored your way to victory! It's time to go to the final world! Your first obstacle is an airship where you fight Bowser Jr. for the third and final time. The first two times he was a pushover, but here he's fairly tricky. Be sure to pack a few raccoon tails and a couple of things. And before you know it, you're at Bowser's castle, where you almost immediately find and face Kamek for the third and final time. And he's easy enough as long as you're good with timing your sandal attacks and those battle spins. Yeah, I forgot to mention he turns all your stickers into sandals. What a jerk. Sandals? Supposedly a powerful wizard and that's the best he can do? Well, I suppose it could be worse. He could have turned them into Chuck E. Cheese tokens. Actually, wait, what am I talking about? That'd be great! 25 more, baby, that Superman inflatable is mine! I gotta say, it's kind of disappointing. Besides Bowser Jr., Kamek was the only one really antagonizing Mario throughout this whole game. And I was sure he was gonna be like, the true final boss and the one really behind everything or something. Kinda like how Dementio was in Super Paper Mario. But you throw open a door, hit him with some sandals, and that's it, he's dead. The castle itself is also disappointing. I know it was the battleship's job, but I was expecting the castle to be a long, tricky, and dangerous final trek to Bowser. But only one very brief obstacle, of course, and you've already found him. And another thing, throughout the whole fight, other than roars, Bowser does not have any lines of dialogue, which is disappointing for Paper Mario title because he delivered some pretty humorous lines in the previous games. I guess the idea is he's so insane with power he forgot how to form words? Thankfully, the fight itself is pretty tough, and if you forgot to go back and replace some stickers after the fight with Kamek, or haven't bought some things with you, or haven't collected lots of plus 5 HP hearts, you'll be in for a tough time. After you knock Bowser off a cliff, he emerges as a giant. You'd think Bowser would learn by now, bigger doesn't always mean better. In the middle of Phase 2, Kirsty decides the only way to beat Bowser is if she sacrifices herself as a usable sticker for Mario. While it is possible to defeat Bowser without using Kirsty if you really want to, there's really no reason to pass up the free five usable stickers per turn. Once Bowser is defeated, Mario obtains the file royal sticker, Peach goes rambling on about wishes, and Mario wishes for Kirsty to come back to life. And then cuts back to the sticker fest, where everyone's having a good time and Bowser is caught trying to steal the comet again. What's odd is that everyone Bowser included just has a good laugh about it. What? The completion bonus is sadly very weak. There's a sticker museum you can unlock by using Paper Eyes to free a toad you see get caught under a fountain earlier in the game. Once you save him, follow him into his house to reach the sticker museum, where he'll ask you to help fill it up with one of every type of sticker. Once you put one of every sticker type in the museum, you'll unlock an enemy viewer, and once you put one of everything in the museum, you'll unlock the music room. These could be cool, but what's bad is that the enemy viewer is bare bones, leaving out fun little things like stats, silly descriptions, and so forth. And the music room only has some tracks! Questionably absent are the boss battle tracks, which are debatably the best songs in the game. And even then, you can just listen to these songs on YouTube! There's also five locations in the game where Luigi appears. If you find Luigi all five times and use Paperize mode to grab him, he'll appear in the parade of the game's ending credits. For a whooping total of less than, like, 20 seconds. Yeah, all right! <laughs> yeah, Luigi! Oh, yeah! Yeah, oh, he's gone. Again, a letdown. He's not coming back, is he? Then there's also the aforementioned flagpoles, which display flags when you complete certain objectives, which are finding all the HP hearts, 
finding all stickers in the game, making all the blue doors appear, finding all the comet pieces, spending 10,000 coins, although the game fails to specify only coins spent at sticker shops count, not coins spent to buy things or on battle spins, getting a perfect bonus in battle 500 times, which involves winning fights within one turn without taking damage, performing 1,000 excellent attacks, which are well-timed A button presses during attacks, and lining up three images on the battle spinner 50 times. These objectives aren't difficult necessarily, but they are very time-consuming, especially if you're terrible at the battle spinner like I am. Other than the flags, though, you get no other prizes for completing these objectives. All in all, the completion bonuses for this game are very lackluster and not really worth the effort. The only reason to fill up the museum is if you like to look at shoes or something. I don't know. The amount of difficulty you have with this game basically boils down to this. How many stickers you have at all times, and how you go about using things. If you take your time to gather every sticker you see, you'll almost always be prepared if an enemy jumps you. If you don't, I wouldn't say you would necessarily be screwed, but it will be slightly or more difficult. And things make fights much easier, especially the bosses. So basically, if you want a more casual experience, gather lots of stickers as often as possible and use things on bosses. If you want a much harder game, don't hoard so many stickers and see how far you can get before you finally give in and use a thing. It really isn't a hard game to finish, either. The only really difficult sections, at least my first run through, were the bosses, but getting the hang of battle spins and knowing which things are best to use will really help. And as I said, though I don't deem it worth it, if you do plan to complete it 100%, it's not hard, just time-consuming. It took me about 25-ish hours to complete the game. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when you hear the same battle theme over and over again trying to get a thousand excellent attacks, the catchiness of the theme soon flies south. Superstar, gotta admit, the team behind it took, took a risk with this one. It's not, you know, traditional Paper Mario gameplay, and it's gonna turn people off, definitely. It kinda did for me at first, but you just gotta let the whole sticker thing slide, and the whole bunch of other... Is, uh, it's at least worth a shot. Again, completing it, there's almost no point to it, unless you just, you like flags. Play it, see how you like it, you know? No completion necessary, at least give it a shot. If you like it, beat Bowser, and that's all you really got. With that in mind, guys, this game gets my completionist rating of... Uh... It's a combination of finish it and play it. Um... How would you... How would you like you combine them? Like, uh... Finish it? Plenish it? Plenish it? No. Fin... Fill... Filet... Filet! Filet! Filet it! This game is a filet. Filet it! That's all the time we have for today, guys. As always, be sure to leave a positive and negative comment in the boxes below. Also, face twit, and that's it. I don't have the other, the other two things. Click here for whatever video I did last time, and if you're far away to the future, there's this thing up here. Also, Big thanks to Youngtown for joining us today. It was it was a pleasure to have you on, bro. You know, I just noticed Youngtown was awfully silent during the whole struggle bit there. Youngtown! You smell bad! Oh no, did the whales get him too? Smash! What? News. There you are. What? What's what, what's going on? Turns out Gerard is actually still alive. I thought you said they found his body. Nah, oh, man. Turns out it was actually Jiraco, the laser clown, which is all right, because we all know that he lives on forever. Oh. Oof. All right. Glad to hear that. Um. Wait. What about Greg then? He called that one. He was actually in the space resort. I wish I had a jacuzzi casino. But... He... It, it can't be. It was... It was supposed to be me. Me! I was supposed to be the one to complete the games. 
I was supposed to be the one to continue the completionist legacy. I was gonna beat everything. Dude, you couldn't even complete that pay-per-view movie we were watching the other day. I had to leave because you fell asleep. You know, I had a heart, but you just uncompleted it. Jerk! Uh, now I have to go buy the heart surgery DLC. <laughs> Actually, on second thought, f that, it's too expensive. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a big drinking problem. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>